the lesson today. Uh, today is December the 17th, uh, 2023. We're going to continue the book of Judges, uh, chapter 5, verses 10 to 11, 10 to 19, I'm sorry. So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to be here one more time to share the word of God. Give us your inspiration, give us your wisdom and your strength so we can share your word properly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, we've been doing the uh, uh, book of Judges, and this is a song of Deborah. Deborah was a prophet uh, that helped to defeat the enemy, the, helped the Israelites to defeat the enemy. Now, Barak, Barak was the general of the uh, Israelites, but he was a weakly general. And he said, I'll go and fight the Canaanites if you, Deborah, go with me. So it was a woman that came up. He said, okay, I'll go with you. I'll give you the strength. So Deborah is a heroine or her hero. This uh, song, okay, mm -hmm. and then they defeat the Canaanites. And here uh, is a song, it's the second part, second part of the song, praising all the people that came to help and uh, putting down people that didn't come to help. And uh, it's praising to God for giving because ultimately the victory belongs to the Lord, mm -hmm. okay? So she's in, in her song, she's praising this, she's praising that, she's praising the Lord. Mm -hmm. So this is the second part of the song. So let me read the uh, let me read the um, verses from 10 to 19. Verse 10, you who ride in, on white donkeys, sitting on your saddle blankets, and you who walk along the road, consider the voice of the singers at the warren places. They recite the victories of the Lord, the victories of his villagers in Israel. Then the people of the Lord went down to the city gates. Wake up, wake up, Deborah. Wake up, wake up, break up on his song. Arise, Barak. The captives, you captives, song of Binoam. The remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was in the people who follow you. From Machir, captains came down from Zebulun, those who bear a commanded stuff. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, sent under his command into the valley. In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Why did you stay among the sheep pens to hear the whistling from the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of the heart. Kiliat stayed beyond the Jordan, and Dan, why did he linger by the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed with his coves. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives, so did Naphtali on the terrace fields. Kings came, they fought, the kings of Canaan, Canaan fought. At Anak, by the waters of Megiddo, they took no plunder or silver. So we're going to, there's a lot of names in here, but we're going to see how these names uh, uh, fit into the story. So let me start with the verse 10. Can you please sure. read verse 10? You who ride on white donkeys, sitting on your saddle blankets, and you who walk along the road, consider. Okay, so he's telling the people, like uh, people of Israel, you who do this, you who do that, consider how the Lord has helped us. So you have to praise, tell everybody how the Lord has helped you. That's the main thing. Okay, so it says here, although in some countries it's kind of disgraceful to ride on donkeys, Yet in Judea, there were no horses, or very few. It was, in riding on donkey was considered honorable. So it was at the time of the Lord. For his riding on a donkey to Jerusalem was not disgraceful, but honorable and glorious. And so it certainly was in those early times of the judges. Now, in the uh, time of Jesus, if you ride on a donkey, it was a humble experience. Mm -hmm. If you ride on the horse, it was a conqueror. Okay? So humble was nothing disgraceful, it's just that uh, you are the Lord rode on a donkey. Mm -hmm. uh, and but in the second coming, you're going to ride on a horse. Gotcha. Okay? So first he came on a donkey, second coming is going to, first coming he came on a donkey, second coming is going to come on the horse. So it's going to be easy. Okay? So it seemed that white donkeys were the most valuable and chiefly used by, by important people. Those that rode on these animals were the princes and nobles of Israel. We are in verse 10. So they are generally interpreted by Jewish commentators as merchants that rode from place to place about business. These are called upon to speak of the wonderful things God had done for Israel, since they were liberated from the bondage of the Canaanites, and now they could ride throughout the country without any fear. Then it says here, you who are sitting on the saddle blanket, this seems to describe the judges. Judges were sitting on a blanket, upon the bench, sitting to hear and try causes, and pass righteous judgment. These are also exhorted to give thanks to the Lord, that now now they then are now are restored to the seats of judgment. 
from which they were driven and could not peaceably exercise their office. Now, even though you were judges, now that you're not oppressed by the enemy, now you can return to the jobs, which is good. So praise the Lord. And you who walk along the road, these are the common people that travel from place to place on business, who before were forced to avoid the public roads, and who go in byways, but now could travel in the common roads without fear, and therefore ought to be thankful. Now these people, the people that uh, common people used to travel roads, but uh, all the highway was in the hands of the enemy. So they, they had to use the uh, other roads, you know, but they were exposed to the enemy. But now that the enemy has been defeated, they have no fear, they can go to everywhere, everywhere. So therefore, you also have to praise the Lord. Okay? Mm -hmm. Verse 11. Mr. Nico. How are you doing? How are you doing, sir? Would you please read verse 11? I like your jacket. Nice. You. It's like a motorcycle jacket, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he used to ride a motorcycle. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no more. Now he rides a... Yeah, he more. rides a, a... A Cadillac. I mean... A, now it's four. A, he he rides um, a car with uh, a license plate that's immune to tickets. Oh, the um, another diplomat. Diplomat. Yeah. Diplomat. diplomat. You see, now he has changed from a motorcycle to a diplomat. Can you imagine that? He's Pretty soon he'd be running for president. Yeah. <laughs> you need to solve me. Huh? You need to solve him? No, 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 no. Thank you. Uh, base eleven. Consider the voice of the singers at the watering places. They recite the victories of the Lord, the victories of his villagers in Israel, and the people of the Lord went down to the city gates. Okay, so consider the voice of the singers at the watering place. So people go to the watering place to get water. And they they sing, and the, but now they're free. Before, uh, they were so afraid of everything, they couldn't even go to, to get water. Meaning either the army of the Israelites who were delivered from the archers a Sisera, Sisera was the uh, enemy at the river Kishon, or the common people that went out of the cities to watering places to get water for necessities, but were frightened by archers that lay in waiting, hiding in the woods. But now the country being clear of the enemy, they could go now without fear to these places or drawing water for the flocks and other uses. Now they said they recite the victories of the Lord, the victories of his village in Israel. So coming back to these places again, people will remember the hazards and danger that were exposed before by the enemy. But now they were free. And this will lead them to acknowledge the righteous dealings of God by taking vengeance on the enemy. And sometimes, you know, they, they tell all these things, so remember how it was before, now you can praise God. Even in our own lives, you know, uh, how many times in our past God has liberated us from danger. And, you know, and then when you face a present danger, you see, well, you were with me before. You can go. You can go with me now. You know, uh, people tend to forget the things that God liberated us from. That. I, in my own life, I, I remember those things, but uh, sometimes forget. When, uh, when I face my present danger, I kind of forget that God, I, I faced this worse before, and God has delivered me. Okay, so we gotta make an effort to remember that God has always been with us. Okay, so the inhabitants of the village in Israel. Now they were not afraid of having their houses broke open. You know, before the enemy would go to their houses, you know, rape their women and steal the things. I mean, they were crazy. But now the enemy is defeated. Now it's okay. It says, uh, and the substance plundered. And those were in the fortified cities who fled from the villages because of the attacks of the enemy. Now these people will go down to the city gates, pass through them, and return to So they can go back to normal, normal life, which is good. Uh, I, I imagine how people f were in, in wars, you know, after the war, then then uh, comes peace, you know, the absence of war, and people were very happy. In Europe, after World War II. Okay, verse 12, um, Romain, please. Wake up, wake up, Deborah, wake up, wake up, break out your song, arise, Barak, take captive, your captives, son of Abinor. Okay, this is the word I, like I was talking to herself. I'm talking also to Barak. I mean, he's, uh, she's very excited, okay, because all these things uh, that have happened. No, now, having called upon all others, Deborah now excites herself with the most earnest and zealous affection to celebrate the wonderful works of God. Here, Deborah finds herself more impressed with a sense of the great and good things the Lord had done for Israel and calls upon her soul to exert all its powers in celebrating the praises of the Lord and describe the loyalty of the tribes and the grandeur of the victory. 
So she went along with Barak, which is a general, to run out his forces. She accompanied him to the field of battle and gave him the word or command to charge, when to charge the enemy. Here, she only speaks of uttering a song of praise on the occasion, what she assigns to him under God, the glory of the victory, and the honor of the throne. But she, as a woman, doesn't take credit for herself. On the contrary, praises God and praises Barak, you know, even though she was the force behind it. She calls on Barak to show his captives and his spoils, that the Israelites might see how great reason they had for giving thanks to God. Although the whole army of Sisera, the enemy, was destroyed, and not a man was left, yet as Barak pursued the Canaanites, many of the enemy were taken captive. And though the Canaanites were to be slain, yet they might first be led captive in triumph. And besides, there might be others from some other nations who were also taken captive. You know, in the uh, after that, in the Roman Empire, when the Romans will fight uh, the enemy and defeat the enemy, they will bring all the uh, captives uh, to Rome in a big procession. And the big procession was the whole town was invited, of course, because you cannot see this too often, maybe once in a lifetime. So they would bring all the all the booty they, they got from the, from the enemy, then put all the captives, all the prisoners, and then got the general, you know, praise everybody, and everybody was praised. It was a great, great celebration. Now those captives, those prisoners, they were gonna be killed anyway. So they were paraded before they were killed. Same way here, you know? I mean, uh, they were using the prisoners to parade them in front of uh, in front of the people, but they were going to be slain anyway. So bef before they were killed, they were paraded. You know, that's great. Well, World War II also, when they Soviets captured Stalingrad, they forced uh, like uh, 10,000 uh, Germans prisoners to the to the streets of Moscow, and after that, they were sent to Siberia, and only a quarter of those came back to Germany years later. So it's not good to. to for, and the Japanese, they were even worse. They would torture the prisoners. War is not good. Okay. So verse 13. Can you please read verse 13? Uh, the remnant of the nobles came down. The people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty. Okay. The remnant of the nobles refers to the people of Israel that stayed, that remain, uh, who have been under the yoke of Jabin in the canon, the, the enemy, under which many of them probably died. But now the few that remain were raised to a high state, a high level, and made to have the dominion over the nobles among the people, that is, over the Canaanite nobility, that were among the people and the Javin, since he now being conquered by the Israelites. His people, even his nobles, became subjects to them. And this was the Lord's doing. Deborah, although being a woman, to whom God gave dominion, either over the mighty ones of Israel, being raised up to be the judge, asserts that the people of the Lord came down to me against the mighty, having been instrumental in the conquest and triumph of the mighty Canaanites, though her, through her direction, advice, command, and presence. And presence. So she is the, uh, the real force behind it. Of course, God inspired her, raised her up to do that. Verse 14, Nico. Some came from Ephraim, whose roots were in Amalek. Benjamin was with the people who followed you. From Makir, captains came down. From Zebulun, those who bear a commander's staff. Okay, now she's praising the tribes. You know, out of all the tribes of Israel, some came to help, some didn't. <laughs> so now she's praising the ones who came to help. Then she's going to put down the people who didn't come, you know? So, the prophet is now having directed the praise to the author of the deliverance, God, proceeds to speak with commendation of the instruments of it and gives us the role of the call of assembly of those tribes who freely offer themselves to battle. And he starts with Ephraim. Some came from Ephraim. Here they were makes mention of the tribes that were siding and assisting in this war and begins with Ephraim, where she herself dwelt, who was a root, foundation, and source of this expedition that under a divine influence directed, animated, and encouraged to it. Then he says, whose roots were in Amalek. Amalek the Amalekites were uh, enemies of Israel. The Amalekites were the constant and sworn enemies of the Israelites, and who were allies with the last of friends of the Moabites. And in all probability took their advantage now against the Israelites by trying to unite their main force with Javin and Sisera, which was the enemy. Against this, Ephraim and Benjamin sent troops, 
to prevent the Amalekites, Amalekites joining with Javin forces. Benjamin was another one, was the was with the people who follow you. Benjamin followed Ephraim example, and they are given the greatest honor because they were the first in this expedition by the example in Korah the Ephraimites. So they encourage each other. Makir was the only son of Manasseh, and he refers to the settlement of the half tribe of Manasseh from which captains came down with a number of men who were ready to put themselves in danger by lending a helping hand against the Canaanites or to be employed as assistants in the barrack in this expedition. So this, we have uh, Ephraim, we have Benjamin, and Makir. And the Sebulon was another one that came to help, another part of the tribes. Sebulon, being a maritime tribe, an employee in trade and navigation, had many clerks, famous for their reigns in handling the pen. So they were clerks, they were office people. However, these, through a zeal for the common cause, dropped their pens and took the sword you know, uh, for the rights or liberties of themselves and their brethren, for which they are just recommended. Now, they were they were clerks, but they dropped it, and they took the sword. Now, for example, if you are in the army, United States Army, and you go through basic training, with early, everybody learns to shoot. But after basic training, some people go to the infantry, some people go to the artillery, some people become clerks, some people become cooks, okay? So you, you be a cook for the rest of your stay in the army. And let's say you are in the boondocks there with the helping the troops and cooking for the for the troops, you know, and the enemy attacks you. Okay? You put the, the pit pots and panel to the side and take your rifle. Because you have basic training, you know how to shoot. The same with the clerk, you're in an office and the enemy overwhelms you. You put your pen aside and take the, your rifle. So everybody has basic training. Everybody knows how to shoot. Even though you do all kinds of jobs, but you are being trained to defend yourself when the call comes, you know. So the same thing here, you know. I mean, they were very good as clerks, but they put the clerk aside and they took out the swords, all right? You have basic training. Sometimes uh, I make this comparison when uh, when I was in another church that uh, uh, it was very easy in that other church to become a member of the church. You just fill out a paper. You don't even have to give your testimony. Fill out a paper, and uh, you, they wouldn't even ask you if you were born again. Just fill out a paper, yes, 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 and then... Okay, and then we you were giving a, a you know like a you sing in the choir, and you're doing this you, you, know, of, you know officials you know, but they they didn't have the basic knowledge of the Bible, they didn't go through basic training, mm. okay, and they were having positions that they shouldn't have, because the basic training was not there. Mm. So if somebody would come to this singer, hey, can you tell me about what it means about the Bible? They wouldn't know. Oh, talk to the pastor. No. You know, if you had that position, you should know about this thing. That's basic. Anyway, I digress sometimes. <laughs> okay, verse 15. <clears throat> the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Yes, Issachar was with Barak, uh, sent under his command into the valley. In the districts of Reuben, there was much a searching of heart. Okay, first of all, the princes of Issachar were with Deborah. Okay? Deborah did not actually take actual part in the battle. She was just uh, like a moral support. Like uh, uh, people like uh, Boadicea, John Mark. Boadicea was an English queen that rebelled against the Romans. But the women don't go, didn't go to war no. those time. Okay. No, no. And John Ark, she went to war. Yeah. Okay, there are a few that went to war. But it seems to have been close to hand in the rear to encourage the combatant. Like uh, the British and German women used to do. They are behind. Go, men, go, men. And uh, at Arab women do to this day. They stay in the rear. Okay? Now, in World War II, some women in the Russian army, they uh, they went to fight. Okay? In the United States, when all the uh, men were fighting in World War II, all the pilots were fighting in World War II, they trained a lot of women pilots for domestic flights. Okay? So all these... Uh, post office, all these mail carry was done by women, pilots, in the United States. They were not sent to combat. Okay? Uh, then uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, clerics, uh, all the factories when the men went to war, the women took over. Okay? But now with this movement of the feminist movement, oh, we can do anything that men can do, which is a lot of baloney, because they can do better things that we cannot do, you know? But the movement said, that's why they put a lot of women in the army now. Okay? 
uh, and sometimes they lower the sun. But that's that's the mentality that's not biblical. Okay, it doesn't work. You know, you cannot have a a women's basketball team play a a, a team from the NBA. <laughs> They get clever, you know, mm -hmm. or, or food. That's why the women are not in the NFL. I mean, come on, you cannot. Anyway, mm -hmm. I digress. <laughs> I digress. Okay. So, the tribe of the tribe of Issachar was with Barak. Barak was an Israeli general, following the counsel and example of the leaders. Whereas Hari as valiant in the cause of Barak, the general, and they were sent under his command into the valley to attack Sisera with his horses and 900 armed chariots with great courage and resolution. So Issachar was courageous, following the example of Barak the general, attack uh, an enormous force in the valley, even though there were only a few in number. Uh, then he says there was much searching the heart. That means, searching the heart means that uh, there was an indecision of these people, searching the heart, okay? That's a, a way of saying they were undecided. Uh, there were much searching of the heart or indecision among the Israelites of the tribe of Reuben. They didn't go. They were debating whether to assist the brethren, the Israelites, against Jabin and free them from his yoke, being aware of the distressed state and condition. However, they were also debating whether to stay home and take care of the flocks and not intervene in the quarrel, maintaining neutrality as the best way for worldly peace. Agreeing to this last decision, no assistance was given. So they were debating. Shall I go to war or stay with the sheep? Ah, I stay with the sheep. So they did not send anybody to fight. They stay there. Okay? <clears throat> so Ruling <clears throat> didn't cooperate in the fight. Okay? So we're going to see him there. Now, this conduct <coughs> of theirs caused much consternation in Deborah and Barak. And also with the princes and people of Israel who could not well understand the reason for this action. The so powerful a tribe and had been assisting to them in the conquest of the land been so fully equipped to help them, and then they act with such indifference. So they could not understand how a Reuben, they had such a powerful tribe, would not even move a finger to help in this uh, fight against uh, the Canaanites. Verse 16. Okay, uh, why did you stay among the sheep, uh, sheep pens to hear the whistling for the flocks? In the districts of Reuben, there was much searching of heart. Okay, so they were saying, why did you come to war, Reuben? Why do you stay there listening to the ship? You know? Uh, why, why do you do that? He's, he's, she's asking not directly, but uh, like a rhetorical question. Why did you come and help us to fight? And you stay with your ship, listen to, to the ship? That's what she said. Being sarcastic. So the tribal Reuben, the tribal Reuben, rich with flocks and herds, chose to stay put, as opposed to get engaged in the war. The judge should be wiser to take care of the sheep and flocks instead of helping the brethren. Perhaps they were afraid that if Javin prevailed, their herds may be taken away from them. So they preferred to stay among the sheep pens to hear the whistling of the flock than the groans and cries of Israel under oppression. <clears throat> among the people of, of Reuben, there was much searching on the heart. Again, they were debating. They felt the patriotic impulse and determined at first to join the ranks of the Western brethren, but retracted from that decision, preferring the peaceful shepherd songs to the trumpet sound of war. In other words, preferring the flocks to the people of God. Um, verse 17, Nico. Gilead had stayed beyond the Jordan, and then why did he linger by uh, the ships? Asher remained on the coast and stayed in his coast. Okay, so in the same way that um, Deborah uh, praised the tribes that came to help, she's also putting down the people that uh, did not come to help. And these were Dan and Asher. And um, so he said, but if there was already acknowledgement of the participating tribes, there was also a stern rebuke for those who set their own safety before the claims of the brethren. Reuben, Gilead, Dan, and Asher, that's four tribes there, okay, refused to join in the battle against Israel. So these four tribes mentioned had the tribal portions well away from the battlefield and were probably not directly affected by the Canaanites' op oppression. Maybe they were too far. That's what the excuse. But it's clear that the appeal was made for their assistance, but it fell upon the deaf ears, for not even a token force was sent. Okay? Not even... Remember when the, in World War II, when, the, when Hitler went to a, 
invaded Russia and needed all the men they can get. Uh, they had, he had helped Franco in Spain in the Civil War before. So now came to call, hey, listen, give us some troops. And uh, Franco didn't want to, to get into the battle. But he sent a talking force, they call it a Blue Division, that volunteers, uh, Spaniards that went to fight in Stalingrad. Of course, a lot of them died, a lot of them were taken prisoners, a few of them came back, you know? I mean, uh, that's what happened. <clears throat> Then he said, Gilead, stay beyond the Jordan. G Gilead was the sign of Machir and grandson of Manasseh. The name here probably means to include Gad, Gad, uh, which is as well as the half tribe of Manasseh. Gilead was divided between the children of Machir and the tribe of Gad. The children of Machir came to battle, but Gad did not. Okay? They did not come to fight the Lord. And then he comes to Dan. Dan, why do you linger by the ships? The Nan Danites that were in Joppa, inhabiting Joppa, and other places, bordering the, the Mediterranean Sea, attending to the ships, the navigation, and merchandise, and which they rather chose to attend than to appear in the field of battle on the behalf of the brethren, using this as a reason, or as an excuse. However, the coast being near the sea, they were planning a flight with the intent of putting their merchandise into ship and flee with them, just in case Cicera will win. Should Caesar get the day and therefore did not join the land of the They thought that uh, the enemy was going to win. So what we're going to do is put our merchandise and leave. So that's why it didn't help either. Uh, now, there was another one, Asher, of course. Asher, the last one. Asher remained on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, attending traffic and business, and did not concern themselves at all with the war. They stay in their towns and cities, the walls of which have been broken down by the Canaanites and remain unrepaired, with no intention to repair them. They felt themselves obligated to stay at home and keep and defend their cities, which were in such a ruinous and weak condition, fearing that the enemy might enter at any time and use this as an excuse for not engaging in a war. Okay? Verse 18, uh, Roman. The people of Zebulun risked their very lives, so did, so did Naphtali on the terrorist field. Okay, in contrast with the selfishness or the tribe we just mentioned, they were a reverts with enthusiasm to the heroic progress of Zebulon and Naphtali. This is just the opposite of the four tribes. Zebulon and Naphtali, there were two tribes who were really involved in the war. Out of them were 10,000 men that followed Barak and were the most active and vigorous. Zebulon showed itself as a people that sacrificed their lives for the deliverance of the fatherland. Naphtali did the same in his mountain home, risking their own lives, exposing themselves to the utmost danger fearless of death itself, they were willing to risk everything for the cause of liberty in which they were engaged. Okay? Verse 19. Kings came, they fought, uh, the kings of uh, Canaan fought uh, at Tanakh by the waters of Meg how is that? Meg Megiddo. Megiddo. They took no plunder of silver. Now she's talking about the enemy. Okay? A lot of the enemy were like a mercenaries. Okay? Mm -hmm. They came and the uh, they didn't get any pay, but they were hoping to get the spoils of war. Okay, that was a bit. Mercenaries sometimes don't get paid, but they, they loot it wherever they go. They loot wherever they go. Okay? So kings they came, they fought, and these were either allied with Javin or subject to him. For it is known that there were petty kings in those parts who were subject to Javin, which also often were subject to one greater and more potent king. The kings of Canaan were the chiefs or the principal Canaanite cities in the plain and neighborhood. Sisera, if not their overlord, was the leader. So Megiddo and Tanakh were two eminent cities which dominated the main pass that runs northeast throughout the hill country, from the plain of Sharon to the valley of Jezreel. Because of this strategic location, the plains of Megiddo has been a frequent battleground from the earliest time. So in biblical history, the forces of Israel under Deborah and Barak crushed the Canaanites by the wars of Megiddo. And there Judah's good king Josiah died in battle against Pharaoh Nico II in 1609 BC. Also in AD 1917, the British under General Allenby ended the rule of the Turks in Palestine by vanquishing them in the valley of Jezreel opposite Megiddo. And also in the book of Revelation 1616, there was a reference to the place in Hebrew that is called Armageddon, Megiddo as a site of the battle of the great day of God Almighty. 
And they say they took no plunder or silver. Some interpret this as meaning that these people fought without pay, whether because they hated the Israelites and uh, they wanted to revenge, or they were trying to get pay out of Israel's spoils. No doubt that even if they could not get sufficient gain from the spoils of war, they hoped that at least would get ransom from the numerous captives which they expected to capture, or from gain derived from selling them into slavery. They came to help of Javin. They came to the help of Javin looking for the spoil of battle, but they really fled empty-handed. So the summary of this whole lesson uh, is that the massive armies of the kings of the Canaanite city-states were met by the might of the forces of nature operating at the command of Israel's God. The violent storm and the turbulence of the swollen Kishon Valley were the chief architects of victory, and the gallant 10,000 Israelites were also instruments of God's will. The Canaanites came thinking that this adventure would be lucrative, namely to enrich themselves with the spoils, but the Israelites fought for liberty. Now, uh, we're talking about uh, Megiddo, and uh, right now, uh, let, me give, let me think five minutes in what I think was going on. For example, what's going on in, uh, in Palestine and Israel, uh, as you know, in AD 70, that's when the temple was destroyed. So 70 years after Christ, the temple was destroyed, and Israel was destroyed. And all the Israelites were going to all over the place. But they still remain, uh, it wasn't Israel, it was Judea, uh, territory of the Romans. And two centuries later, the, the Israelites rebelled against the Romans again. And the Romans defeated them. Okay? For what I know, at that time, the emperor was Hadrian. That was the name of the Roman emperor. And he changed the name from Judea, for what I read, from Judea to Palestine. Why? Because the enemies of Israel were the Philistines. And just to copy that, the Philistines were people from the sea, were invaders. They were originally Greeks. And they were fighting the Israel throughout forever. Goliath was a Philistine. Yeah. Well, but when the uh, Babylonians took over Israel, the Philistines were wiped out. No more. So Hadrian, 200 after AD, changed the name of Judea to Palestine. Okay, so it was Palestine. It was a region. Now the Roman Empire had two empires: one in the in the west and one in the east. The one in the east fell before, you know, through the uh, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, whatever. Now the uh, Roman Empire in the east fell centuries later to the hands of the Ottoman Empire. The capital was Constantinople. Now, when the Ottoman Empire took over, Palestine came into possession of the Ottoman Empire for the Turks. The Turks are not Arabs. Okay, I mean, multi Arab. So, for 400 years, Palestine was in the hands of the Ottoman Empire. Okay? In that region, it was never a country, Palestine. It was a region where Arabs and Jews lived and other people. Okay? Now, for 400 years, they got this Palestine. Until 1918. When the Ottoman Empire allied themselves to Germany and after Hungary, and they lost the first war. Okay? When they lost the first war, they lost the possessions too. So England took over. So England took over Palestine. Okay? And they made an agreement to give the Jewish people a homeland in Palestine in 1919. But then oil was discovered in the Arab countries. So England backed off. Okay? And in 1948, in 1948, legally, the state of Israel was created by the United States. Legally, even Russia voted for it because the Holocaust or whatever. Now, many countries have been created in 1948. All these countries in Yugoslavia, Serbia, you know, or Montenegro, all that, they're all independent countries. Czechoslovakia, you know, uh, now is uh, Czech, with capital Prague, and uh, uh, Slovakia, capital Bessarabia, I believe. So all these countries have been created. Africa, forget it. Algeria was created. All this kind of began after 1948. And nobody complains about it. Okay? But they question the legality of Israel. I'm talking about from the point of view, legal point of view, not the spiritual. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that's the land that uh, legally. So legally, Israel has a right to be there. Like so many other countries have legal. Why, why people don't complain about other countries, but they do complain mm -hmm. about Israel? Because Israel, because the, uh, and the, the lie is that uh, 
Palestinians were living there. And the Israelis came over and kicked out the Palestinians. That's a lie. Okay? Because a lot of Palestinians are citizens of Israel. Okay? And they have it very well. All right? So, when Israel was created, there was the West Bank and there was the Gaza Strip. The West Bank was given to the Arabs, and Jordan had it there, and the Gaza was given to the Arabs, and Egypt had it. But they did not accept it. They declared war to Israel the following day after the, uh, Israel was created. Uh, but they lost the war. They invaded Israel, but they lost the war. Okay? And then in 1966, Israel took over the West Bank and the Gaza Strip and the Golan Heights border in Syria. But then, as a gesture for peace, they gave the Gaza Strip to the Arabs, even though they had in the possession with all the settlements. But what, what, the, what the people in Gaza did, they elected Hamas, which is a terrorist organization, which they put rockets all over the place. And that's what happened there. Now, if Mexico sends rockets to the United States, what's supposed to the United States do? Retaliate. Okay, and once once things start, you know, once the war starts, forget it, you know, chaos. Okay? And uh, like I said before, uh, in times of war, the first casualty is the truth. Okay? But this, but legally, Israel has a right. So all these students in Harvard and Yale protesting free Palestine, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. They have no idea about history. Because everything was said, they can Google it. Okay? It's just idiots. Oh, young people, you know, there was um, there was one uh, French prime minister, George Clemenceau. I tell you the story about some other time. But he's is the one who said that uh, if a man when he's young is not a liberal, he has no heart. But the same man when he's old is not a conservative, he has no brains. <laughs> And people usually, when they're young, they say, yeah, yeah, everything's great, yeah, Marxist thing, Marxist. but then when they start paying bills and they have a wife and kids, hey, this is not so good, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, I guess we don't have part. <laughs> so when you get to that point, okay, remember when you have a, a little girl, you're going to name it Jair. <laughs> okay, so uh, any questions about what we just talked about, because it's about time. Let me close it up with a, list, with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time to share your word. Thank you for allowing us to uh, to share your word, God, with people who are here or who are watching it uh, on the video. Thank you for giving us your wisdom, your inspiration, and your strength to share the word properly. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me close this up.